Welcome to our Wednesday night online Bible study. I know we can't be here in person, um, connecting with high fives and hugs and handshakes, but we are here connecting by our hearts and connected through God's Word together. So I hope you have your, your Bibles, your, a notepad, a pen, or a pencil, and you're ready to take notes. But before we do, let's just, as the music plays, let's just go to Lord in prayer. Let's just seek God for a number of things. First of all, for the leaders in our, in our country, in our world that are battling this virus, that is um, battling this, epi- uh, this pandemic today. Let's pray that God's wisdom will be given to them and direction given to them. Let's pray for our health care professionals, our doctors and our nurses that's on the front line. Let's pray for their safety, um, that God will put a hedge of protection around them. Let's pray for our scientists today that's, that's trying to come up with a cure and the medicine that will help us um, with this virus. And then let's, uh, let's pray for those that are already infected with this virus. Let's ask God to place his hands upon them, heal them right now, give them comfort and peace and help them get back on their feet and keep them safe through this. And then let's pray for the churches all around the world. Um, let's give them a boldness right now, not to step back or to slow down, but to go forward, a boldness to, get, to help them to go forward, to share the hope of this world. When many people are wondering where is their hope, um, I pray that the churches will step up to the plate and truly show that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. So let's bow our heads right now. Let's, let's just go to Him. Let's quiet our spirits and let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Let's pray. Lord, right now we come to you. We come to you in this time of of all the confusion in this world right now. In it, in all this chaos, and there are many people that are been affected with this virus, Lord, been touched by it. And I truly pray that you will I'm be in the middle of it, Lord, that you will help through it, that you will touch each individual, that you'll give hope to this world, that people will see you in the midst of all of it. We pray for our leaders right now, Lord, that you will lift them up, that you will give them wisdom and direction. We pray for our healthcare professionals, that you will keep them safe. We pray for the scientists, Lord, that are coming up with a cure, that you will give them the direction. We pray for those that are affected, that you will truly keep them safe and help them to get well. Heal them, Lord Jesus. We pray for the churches. We pray for the church in general. That we will go outside these walls. That we're not closed for business. Or that we have truly just gone out into the world. And are doing exactly what you're asking us to do. To show your love to a hurt and dying world. So Lord, I pray that your glory will be shown through all of this, that our fears will go down and our faith will go up, Lord. That you will truly use us to impact the world. That you'll see us through all of this. We love you and we thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, we're going to be talking about today knowing our God because truly, if we know our God, we'll grow closer to our God. And when we grow closer to our God, you know what? Our fears and our anxiety and our blood pressure and our worries and our our stress levels, they all go down. But what builds up in us is our joy in our lives. When our fears go down, it gives us room for our joy to grow and our faith to grow. 
And so we need to talk about knowing our God and the different things about our God. And we've talked about, in the last two weeks, we've talked about the, the God that's unchanging, that doesn't change. So we can trust his promises. We can trust his direction. We can trust his wisdom. We can trust him. Why? Because in the midst of this world, it seems like everything's thrown up in the air. That's changing around us every day. And it seems like there's chaos. There's a God that never changes. And that's what we can grab a hold of. And, and know we can trust him and have hope in him, in the Lord. So we talked about the unchanging God. We talked about the greatness of God or the majesty of God, meaning God is majestic. He is above all things and he's all powerful and he's in control of everything. And so we know who has us. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you know that he has you and he's got you in his hands and he'll see us through all of our storms and all of our problems throughout our lives and throughout every step we take during the week and during our days. So God, the greatness of God. And today, here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the wisdom of God. God is wise. But when we start that, let me just ask this question. And maybe you can. I'm going to give you a chance just to write down maybe a word on your notepad or on a piece of paper beside you that comes up when you think of wisdom. What do you think of? When you think of... the God is wise, what do you think of? What comes to your mind? In other words, what does the Bible mean when it calls God wise? What does it mean? What does the Bible mean when it calls God wise? You know, the wisdom of the world, and, and if you go to Webster's Dictionary, here's the definition we, we, we get. Wisdom is the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. That's wisdom for the world. In other words, we can be considered wise because of we have a lot of experience. We have a lot of things that we have done. So we have knowledge in us. And in fact, we make good judgment because of that. But wait a minute. There's some flaws in that. Um, there's some, some really good flaws, big flaws in that. Listen to what a theologian, one of my favorite theologians said about wisdom God's wisdom in fact it's J.I. Packer and here's what he says wisdom is in fact the practical side of moral goodness as such it is found in its fullness only in God did you hear that only in God he alone is naturally and entirely and invariably wise God is never other than wise in anything that he does Wisdom, as the old theologians used to say, is his essence, just as power and truth and goodness are his essence, integral, integral elements, that is, in his character. So we can never have real wisdom outside of God. I don't think we can ever have real wisdom without having a relationship with God. There are many people that think we can, but here's the problem. We can't see tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen. In fact, listen, man's wisdom, human wisdom can be frustrated by circumstantial factors outside the wise person's control. In other words, we don't know what's going to happen the next breath. We're not promised another breath. We're not promised another moment in time. So how can we really... Um, really be wise in our decisions. We can try to because of our experiences and because of our knowledge in those, in those experiences in life. But how can we really have wisdom? There's a, there's a story in 2 Samuel. It's a story of David that's being attacked by his son Absalom. And Absalom, in fact, David's counselor, trusted a counselor, kind of sided with Absalom. And his name was um, Ahithophel. And Ahithophel went over to David's side. He made the wise, he thought it was a wise decision to go and be with David or with Absalom and do and be on his side, in fact. And Absalom really had David on the ropes a little bit 
you could say. In fact, he had attacked David and he was trying to overthrow David. And David was, um, was really um, down a little bit and discouraged a little bit and weakened at this time. And so here's what Ahithophel said to Absalom. He said, he told him, he gave him advice. He said, now what you need to do is um, finish it off. Finish David off. This is the time. He's weak. He's ready for it. He's, he's, he's ready to be taken. You can overcome him right now. Now finish him off at this time. And Absalom decided not to do that. Absalom decided to go another direction and really did not overcome and, and, and gain the throne at all and did not take out David at the time. And so here is his advisor that thought he had made a good decision, but he couldn't control the, the decision of Absalom. And so he found out that he had no control of that. So what did he do? Knowing that now he's going to be seen as a traitor and possibly charged with that, he went off and killed himself, committed suicide at that time. See, there are things in our lives every single day that we don't know what's going to happen, but we think we do and we try to make wise decisions and we don't even know past the day. In fact, James, in James 4, 13 through 15, says it this way. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord's will, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. That's how we should live our life, isn't it? Um, we should live our life saying the Lord's will is what we should do. We should, it should make us fall on our knees and seek God and say, it's the Lord's will that we should do. We don't know what's going to happen in our lives, but we're going to go with the Lord and let Him direct our path. Let Him give us wisdom in our lives. See, we can't change some things. We can't change everything. We can't change um, uh, certain situations. We can't control things that might happen in tomorrow or the next day when we're making our decisions. But there's a God that can. Listen, God's wisdom is omniscience governing om omnipotence. In other words, infinite power ruled by infinite wisdom. It's a basic biblical description of divine character. Here's what Job said in chapter 9, verse 4. God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and prospered? The answer is no one can. Man, he has wisdom, all-knowing, and he has all the power right there. It comes hand in hand. In Romans 16, 25 through 27, here's what Paul said. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the wor world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all the nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Now, let me ask you something. How do you know? Why is it that we say as Baptists, we talk about the perseverance of the saints? How is it that, that we know that if we give our life to Jesus Christ, that we know that one day we will see the finish line of that, that he will bring us all the way to glory, that nothing can take us out of the Father's hands, that nothing can... Can We can't lose our salvation because the Holy Spirit living inside of us will see us over that finish line. How do we know that? Because it comes with a God that's all-knowing, that knows everything in our life, knows all the things that we're going to go through. He knows the beginning and the end. It knows, he knows everything, and he comes with all the power. See, you don't, in, in God, we don't divorce wisdom and power. It doesn't separate like it does in our lives. See, wisdom without power would be pathetic. It's kind of like a broken reed. And then power without wisdom would be merely frightening. But in God, 
He comes with boundless wisdom and endless power. They are united and this makes him utterly worthy of our fullest trust in him. Why do I trust God? Because he comes with, he's an all-knowing God. He's an all-powerful God. It all comes together right there. And so I put my full trust in him. I surrender everything to him. Now, you might be saying, well, preacher, pastor, um, how does that look like in life? What does that look like in our lives? How can we have that kind of wisdom in our lives? And where I want to go today is this. In, in Genesis 12, go all the way back into Genesis, the 12th chapter, and go to verses 10 through 20. You know, how does God deal with mankind with his wisdom? How does he give him that wisdom? What does he do when we mess up, when we go off the path? What does he do? And I think the be one of the best places is looking at um, when Abram left Canaan. God told him to go and leave it to, to take his family with him and go off to Canaan and make a home there. He was going to do great things with Abram at that time and that family. And he had these promises that he was fulfilling in Abram's life. And so there became a, uh, came a famine in the land. And Abram got worried and got anxious. You know, sometimes he, he would get very anxious. And what do you do is he step out of God's will. Um, it kind of sounds a lot like us sometimes, doesn't it? Maybe your life, that you see this fear rise up in you at times and you start to grab a hold of your own life. You see, Abram should never have left Canaan, should never have left his home because God didn't tell him to go. But he, he heard that there was food down in Egypt, so he went to Egypt. That's the first issue he had. But listen to what he says in verses 10 through 20 in Genesis 12. It says, now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there. For the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarah, his wife, Indeed, I know that you're a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. Uh, how does he know what's going to happen? How does he know that Pharaoh and the people of Egypt would say, hey, let's kill him and let's take his wife? He doesn't know. Now, maybe it was a common practice at the time, no doubt. But see, God's above all of that, isn't he? God's above everything. And so here is here's, um, Abram that's already left Canaan land. He already left that, his home and he went down because he was fearful. His fear had risen. His anxiety had risen. His stress level probably had risen. And he took off without God telling him to go because really God could have taken care of him right there. And here he tells his wife to lie for him. Pick it back up in verse 14. So it was when Abram came into Egypt, that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. And the princess of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the, women, or the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abraham, Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh... And his house was with, with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh com commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. What a story that is. There's some lessons that Abraham needed to learn, wasn't there? Why is it that he just took off? I, I know his fear grew up and grew in him, and he thought he needed to take control of his life, his own life. But why? What could he have done better? 
I want you to kind of write these down because here's the truth. You and I, we tend to do this sometimes possibly, right? We tend to let our fear grow. We tend to let our anxieties grow. And when they do, we try to grab a hold of our own life and take care of our own life. Even though it might go against God's word, it might go against what God wants in our life at the time. You know, the first thing is this. We need to practice, or Abram needed to practice the, the practice of living in God's practice, uh, presence. The practice of living in God's presence. Number two, he needed to see all of life in relation to God. Man, there's a bigger picture out there. It's not just our little vantage point. There's a big picture. God sees the big whole picture and that we need to look at our life through the lenses of, of God's word and through God at times. We need to see all of life in relation to God and then we need just to look to him. Abram needed to look to God. Looking to God. Now maybe today and right now you feel God speaking to you the same way he spoke to Abram. The same way he did. Turn with me to chapter 15 of Genesis. Just in verse 1. Listen to this. This is really neat. He says, God says, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Man, he's telling Abram right there, hey, you didn't need to leave. You didn't need to lie. You could trust me with your life because I'm your shield. I'm your protector. I'm your defender. I'm the one that goes before you. You can trust me, not yourself, not anybody else, but me. I am your shield. I am your defender. And then here's another one. I'm your great reward. I love the term he used here. Exceedingly great reward. There's nobody greater than Almighty God. There's nobody greater. Man, just being able to walk and talk with him and have a relationship with him, that's your reward. We don't need anything else in this world. We don't need anything else in life. See, we grab our li- we grab a hold of our lives and we grab a hold of the world and we say we want all of these things. We want the possessions. We want the money. We want uh, all of this world. And then when something comes and it, it threatens our world, here's the truth. We fall apart or we step out of the will of God and we try to protect ourselves and, we, and it really fails on us. And God's saying to Abram, I'm your shield, I'm your reward. And then in Genesis 17, verse 1, he says, I am Almighty God. Listen to this. Walk with me, walk before me, and be blameless. Did you hear that? Walk before me and be blameless. In other words, I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want you to be obedient to me. I want you to stay true to me and let us walk this thing called life together. And I'll see you through the storms. I'll see you, see you through your anxieties and your worries and all the different things that happen in your life. I'm the one that will see you through all of this. Hey, the other night, the other day, I think it was Tuesday morning, that I had my uh, devotional. And I talked about a man that I met when I was um, early as a pastor. He was 100 years old. And he talked about all the storms in his life he saw. I mean, he saw, under, in 2006, he was 100 years old. So he saw the 1918 flu pandemic. And he even said that one of his relatives died in that. And he saw that through. He saw how his father and his mother got through that time when they were quarantined in their homes also up in Virginia. He also talked about seeing the Great Depression as a young man, seeing, uh, going through the Great Depression and seeing his, his wife die of cancer and his son die of cancer and his, his second wife even die of heart trouble, heart problems. And I just asked the question, how, do you, how did you see th- all that through? What helped you with that? And he said this because we were diving into Psalm 27 the other morning. He just said, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my light. 
The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my light. That was his, his, really his life verse. His father's life verse, in fact. And that's how they saw it through. They just, they plugged and they looked to the Lord himself at that time. They dove in and they were obedient to the Lord. They understand who their shield was. They understood that he was their great reward and he was almighty God. And here's what they were going to do. They were going to walk before God and be blameless before God. And that's where we, if we want the wisdom of God and understand and hear his voice talk to us and direct our lives, that's what we must do in our lives. Not jump off the bandwagon because we get nervous or we get scared or this pandemic comes in and maybe we're quarantined or maybe you're getting antsy because you're in home a long time and you're ready to get out and you're ready for this to all be done. I'll tell you something, I really am. I'm ready for all to be done. I'm ready to see each and every one of you in person to just be able to celebrate together how God sees us through. But while we're here, we're going to live for him. We're going to walk before God. We're going to be blameless before God. That's what I am striving every day to do, to grow my faith and let God destroy my fears and see us through this. That's what we'll do. I love this. The psalmist in Psalm 73, 25 and 26 says this. Whom have I in heaven but you? He's talking to God. And there's none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We need to see God in our life as our commander as our defender, as our rewarder of life. There is nothing like him. There is nothing. We need to dive into a relationship with him and give our life to him right there. See, all this stuff that's happened in our life, it should not, we should not be taking back when all these unexpected and unsetting, uh, upsetting and discouraging things happen to us now. You know, the questions come up, what do we do? What does all this mean? What does it mean when things come up in our lives and all these things happen in our lives? What does it mean for us? What did it mean for Abraham? That God in his wisdom means to make something of you which you have not attained yet. He's just working something out in you and in me which we have just not attained. We're in the process of, of becoming great and becoming an image of God, image of Jesus Christ. You know, what does that mean in our life? Well, he might mean to strengthen us in patience, good humor, compassion, humility, or even meekness he wants to do in your life. He might have a new lesson for you in self-denial, self-distrust to teach you. He might wish to break you of complacency or unreality or undetected forms of pride and conceit. See, his purpose might be to simply draw you closer to him in conscious communion with him. For it is often the case of all the saints, and all the saints know, that fellowship with the Father and the Son is most vivid and sweet, and Christian joy is at its greatest when the cross is the heaviest. When the cross is the heaviest. See, he might be preparing you for forms of service of which at the present time you have no idea. God's got greatness for you. God's got special things for us in, in our walk with him. You know, he even, God even taught his son, grew his son, Jesus Christ, through hard times, through storms. In Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, here's what it says. Though he was a son, talking about Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. See, right now today, I, I could be talking to two groups of people. You might be here today and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
You've come into church at times. You've, re- you've read the Bible every now and then. You might even have a Bible. It is the, the greatest um, book, the, the, the best-selling book of all time. So many people have it. But you don't have a relationship with them. You've never surrendered your life to Jesus. And so right now, your destination, if something happens today, would be to the depths of hell. It would be eternal death. That's not judging anyone. That's a fact. And in fact, that's loving you right now. Because it says in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And the truth is, God loves you with an incredible love. And he sent Jesus Christ, fully man but fully God, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for you and defeating your sins where you don't have to pay the price. Because the Bible tells us that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that, all, that the result of that sin is death. Somebody has to die. But God sent his son to die for you. And then three days later, he rose from the grave, defeating death. And so when you leave this world, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you will be separated from an almighty God for all eternity in a place called hell. But listen, Jesus has made that way for you. And all you have to do is say, I'm a sinner, Jesus, and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave, and I surrender my life to you. And from that day forward, you put your trust in him, and you walk obediently with him all the days of your life. Now, you might be here today listening and you are a follower of Jesus and you've given your life to Jesus, but you're kind of out of sorts with him right now. You're out of fellowship and here's why. Because really, you've not lived this way. You've gone off the path, kind of like Abram and all the dead and so many saints before him. You, you grab a hold of your life and you've done your thing and maybe because of that, you feel the conviction that God has put on your life. You feel a, a hurt or a, a void in your life or, a, or God just squeezing you right now and you're wondering why. Maybe it's you're not falling on your knees enough. You're trying to take control of your own life. And it's not really working out because it never will. When we go away from the will of God, man, we, we fall down. But here's what I think is so neat. God picks us up and brushes us off and says, let's keep going. That's who God is. And if we will learn to seek him and seek his wisdom at all times, and he will help us through this thing called life, see us through the finish line one day, and in the glories of heaven one day. So here's the question for you and I, and we'll close on this. How can you and I receive the wisdom of God? How can I get the wisdom of God? Here's the first thing, and I really want you to write this down. We must reverence God. We must, you must reverence God. In other words, you must humble yourself. You must become teachable. You must stand in awe of God's holiness. You must get to know him so well that you're in awe of him. Proverbs 9.10, Solomon says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if we want wisdom, we have to learn to fear God, to be in awe of God, and to humble ourselves, sit before him at his feet, and allow him to teach us, and we walk with him every single day. We must reverence God. But the second thing is this. We must receive God's word. You and I, we must receive God's word. Psalm 119, 89, excuse me. Psalm 119, 98 through 99. Here's what the psalmist says. You, talking about God, through your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. How would you like to say that? You make me wiser than my enemies. For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. How is that? For your testimonies are my meditation. Your testimonies are my meditation. And he's learned to make the Bible the standard of his life. 
to live by it every single day, to seek it, to seek God in his word, to pray, to open his word and to read his word and meditate upon his word and let the spirit fill you with all teaching and all knowledge of his word and you pray through his word and you don't act until God speaks and directs your path because he's the all wise, he's the all knowing, he's the all powerful God. That's how we should live our life every single day. If we did that and we were obedient all the time, man, our communities and our world, man, it would be healed. Not because of who we are, because the God that lives inside of us, who he, he is in our lives. Wow. See, let's understand that God is both all wise and all powerful. And that can't ever separate. Understand that. And let that bring us to a reverence before God and lead us to a meditation or lead us to meditate on God's word. Let that right there grow us during this time. Let that help us to lower our fears and raise our faith. And know your God in the midst of all of this today. And let's watch God through all this storm today. Let's see him go forward and do amazing work. Hey, I'm going to have a, a prayer right now. But before I do, let me just say this. I hope you have a wonderful evening. I hope that, I, that you'll connect with us this coming Sunday. Remember, 9.30... 9.30 is the children's message. So if you have grandchildren or children, hey, 9.30 a.m. on our website, woodlawnbc.net, or on our Facebook page, you can catch, or on YouTube channel, you can catch, um, you can catch that children's message that our family pastor has put out there for us, for you to connect that way. And then at 10 a.m., you can, in the same places, you can also connect with us as we open up God's Word this week in that Sunday morning message. I hope you'll do that. Let me pray, but you have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we love you for all that you do. And Lord, go before us as our shield, as our protector. Lord, help us to understand that you are the Almighty God creator of everything that you can protect us and that you can that you can um, be our shield no matter what comes our way you are almighty god help us to walk blamelessly with you lord and before you grow us in seeking you in your word grow us in getting on our knees and seeking you for your wisdom lord and we thank you for what you've done in our lives and what you're going to do lord and I pray, and we continue to pray for these, this season of our life, Lord, to watch you do your thing. To watch you and to be amazed at the God that goes before us and takes care of this situation and this issue. And we will celebrate and we will thank you, Lord. We look forward to the day we can come in and celebrate together, right here together. Until then, Lord, we will connect in your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.